Robinson. I'm the president of the James T. Martin Center for Academic Renewal. We are a nonprofit here in Raleigh, North Carolina that works on higher education issues. Specifically, we do research into the critical issues in higher education and find policy solutions that can be implemented by boards of trustees, boards of governors, and state legislatures. Um, and tonight I'm talking with Mark Neely, and I will let him introduce himself. Yes, I'm Mark. I'm Mark McNeely. I'm a professor at UNC uh, in a business school. I've been there since about 2011. Part of that, worked a number of years. I want to tell you how long. <laughs> many, many years in uh, tech, IBM primarily, and then Lenovo. Uh, so that that kind of drives my interest in technology. Uh, I was a marketing exec, and so was used to explaining technology in ways that people could understand the value of it, both individually and um, <clears throat> and for their organization. So that's a little bit of my background. Excellent. So I'm going to start really simple with what is chat GPT and how is it different from other AI? And I, I should also say that you know, I tried to get on and use chat GPT, but there was a wait list. So I think a lot of people are probably in that position where they're curious, but actually can't access it right now. Sure. So chat GPT, we've had AI for a long time, right? So if you use social media and you do search, you're using AI. Right, but a lot of it's invisible to you. It's happening sort of behind the scenes. If you have Siri, right, that's AI. You have Alexa, that's AI. If you have a Tesla autopilot or you've got any of that, that's AI. But it's kind of invisible. It's kind of behind the behind the curtain, if you will. So I think what ChatGPT does that's different <coughs> is it both can interact with you more um, as a human um, and it does more human things, right? So you can use it more as, it just as a human, just asking the questions. Uh, and getting very, very elaborate answers versus like Siri or Alexa. Um, and that's just one type of what's called generative AI. So generative AI, essentially you can enter text or now image or, and potentially other things. And based on this training, it generates um, either text or images or video or audio, right? So, and it does that based on what it's been trained on. So it could be trained on images, um, like Midjourney or Dali are, is trained on images, ChatGPT is trained on text, uh, but, and now images with ChatGPT4. So basically, it's a neural network that has a large, what's called a large language model. It's basically, the, assume, you, assume it's the internet, is trained on that, and from that can generate answers to your text, and, text entries. You can think of it sort of the earlier version, it's sort of like autocomplete, you know how you type something in, like, you know, um, <clears throat> got out of bed on the right, wrong side, right, got out of the wrong side. So it just knows what's coming next, right, so it predict, can predict that. That's kind of how it was at the beginning, now it's, you can think of it as a huge database of the internet that I can query with natural language, right, just with my, with my voice, so. Uh, but it fundamentally changes, um, how we interact, I think, with with computers in a way that's um, that's very different because it's going to be changing our jobs. It's going to be changing um, education. It's going to be changing. And it's also a sort of a lead into you know, where AI might be going. Thanks. So, how did you get interested in chat? GPT specifically, I, I don't think that you've done work on other AI. Like you didn't wake up and say, you know, Alexa is, is a danger. I need to I need to do some research on Alexa. So why Chat GPT? What you know? What was it? Um, it just I just started playing with it, right? <clears throat> so when it came out, it came out in uh, late November 2022. <clears throat> I started playing with it sort of over in December and over the the winter break, and I was just amazed by what it could do. Um, and January 8th, it, it, I started reading about it and coming from a tech background, I could understand, you know, how it's sort of, you know, how it's built at a very high level. Um, and could see some of the possibilities of it when you, once you start playing with it. And so in January 8th, I sent an email to the provost saying, like, we need to have a university task force on this. Um, was able to get some other folks, you know, interested in it. Um, in the meantime, you know, lots of things have happened. ChatGPT4 has come out. And so, if anyone, anyone familiar with Microsoft Copilot, yeah, you know, basically, um, you can now put theoretically. We'll see what it actually looks like, but you can enter prompts and create Word documents and PowerPoint presentations and code. And it's, so, it's going to be 
amazingly powerful and change people. And if you use Office, it's going to change your life, right? Uh, it's certainly your work life anyway. So it was just that interest in technology and then starting to play with it. And then it really, I mentioned mythology and culture. <clears throat> and you think about, and so I started also learning a lot about Sam Altman and OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT. And he's got a very interesting view of the world. His view is essentially, and he's sort of a group <clears throat> of, philosophy, of philosophies that the folks there in Silicon Valley adhere to, especially in OpenAI. But Basically, the AI is going to become more and more, and more intelligent and uh, do more and more things. And basically, everybody's going to be on universal basic income because it's going to do everything. So I think that's maybe going to get to your next question about artificial. Right, so the next thing I was going to ask is, um, so I did a little bit of research. I saw there are three types of AI, narrow, general, and superior. And so where are we now? Where are we going? What is, what is chat? GPT, what is Alexa or Siri or any of the other things we might be uh, familiar with? Yeah, so one way to think about it, artificial intelligence is artificial narrow intelligence, artificial general intelligence, and artificial super intelligence. And so where we are mostly now, especially prior to chat GPT, was artificial narrow intelligence, <clears throat> where it can do a specific task very well. Maybe, you know, you could say as well as a human, because we all make mistakes, right? And it makes mistakes. <clears throat> you know, driving, right? So if you think about autopilot, or you think about Alexa, or you think about ranking, um, you know, for search, it can do some specific jobs very well. Artificial general intelligence <clears throat> is something that OpenAI, again, the company behind ChatGPT, and that now I think everyone else, now that OpenAI has sort of opened the floodgates, you know, so Google's going after it, Meta's going after it. Um, Artificial general intelligence is saying, I can no longer just do one little job really well. <clears throat> I can do everything a human can do. <clears throat> everything a human can do, as well as a human, right? And when you think about artificial general intelligence, I mean, you, you can kind of see a nod there, or kind of the direction where ChatGPT is going, because it's essentially the entire internet, right? When you put, when you put ChatGPT, the new release for it on Bing, which is Microsoft's, um, well, it's, it's their version of uh, of Google search in a way, right? So um, it's, their, it's the way you can search on it, but it chats with you, but it can access the internet, right? So you now have some something that can, is, is, is in a sense, can reply like a human, but unlike you, it can surf the internet in seconds and generate an answer. Right? Whereas you would have to go do a Google search, you have to go figure everything out, you'd have to go type it up, it would take you maybe an hour to figure that out, it can do it in like 10 seconds. Right? So, and not only it has, it has access to every, all the, all the basically all the human knowledge, at least on, you know, on Western Internet. So, that's artificial general intelligence. And then artificial super intelligence is like, oh, it's not only as good as we are, it's much smarter than we are. So if you think about how many people play chess, or Play chess. How many people have played Go? So Go, yeah. So Go is a, Go is a Chinese game, which is much more complex than chess. Um, and so we, you know, we humans, machines were able to beat the best chess player. I think back in the '90s, but then Go was thought to be impossible to beat, right? For a, a chess player, or for excuse me, for a computer to beat because it was so complex. There were so many moves. Um, but there is a company called DeepMind, which is now owned by Google, um, that is, uh, they created a thing called AlphaGo to beat the best Go player in the world. And it did a few years ago. Um, and it beats them so well that uh, the guy, the, the best Go player in the world, quit playing Go. It's like, what's the point? Because I can't beat Go. You guys know what's sad, isn't it? <laughs> But this is points to humanity. It's like if, you, if, you, if, if machines can do everything better than we can, then kind of like, what's the point, right? Like, what's the point of learning, right? What's the point of doing things? Where does the meaning come from? So, so beyond the fact that it can help me cheat, uh, my homework is the longer term implications of what do things like general intelligence and super intelligence mean for humanity, and, and what it, you know, what it means to be to be human. And you can flip it around the other way, and you can say like. You know, so a large language model, basically, it, you think of it as it, it, it goes out there, reads a bunch of stuff, condenses it, and spits it back out, and it has biases based on what it's trained on. You could make the case, 
that, well, we're all large language models, right? We all go out and read stuff, and then we turn it around and digest it and spit it back out. We all have biases. But this large language model knows a lot, <laughs> knows a lot more by itself than any of us individually do. So, um, so I think there's some fundamental questions that you have. I think short term, the, the AI gives us some amazing tools. Um, you can do some really creative things. I, I do a sub stack where I talk about cross domain thinking, where you can ask it a question, say, what can ants tell us about um, US defense strategy, right? So, so, so you pick it, whatever your domain is, right? So maybe it's defense strategy. Um, and so it'll come out and say, okay, hey, so ants um, work together, or they, they do swarms, right? They'll do an ant swarm, so that could be a, a strategy. Or decentralized um, uh, operations is another thing that ants do, right? And so you can apply, it'll, it'll take them and just generally apply all those ideas to your domain, right? And you can take any domains or any concepts from anywhere and apply them to your domain, and it'll spit it out. It'll give you a whole bunch of creative ideas um, that you never thought of before. So one of the things that people said about AI is that, well, it can't be creative. Well, it can really help you be creative a lot, right, if you use it correctly. And there's a saying, you know, and I'll flip it back to you, but there's a saying that um, a lot of people are worried about, you know, losing their job to AI, right? Um, it's, the saying is, you won't lose your job to AI, you're going to lose your job to a person who knows AI, right? And so, if you're really interested in, in keeping your job, <laughs> depending on your job, now if you're like a, you know, if blue collar jobs actually are safe jobs, it's the cognitive jobs that are the ones that are most at risk, right? Because that's where AI can really play well, right? We don't have robots that can do stuff at all, like a plumber or anything else, right? Um, so that's, that's the question. So one of the things you mentioned just now was cheating on your homework. So that's, that brings us to the university setting, right? Which is what I'm normally thinking about. Um, and I have a lot of faculty friends, and I saw that when chat GPT came out, you know, some of them were banning it in the classroom, some of them were finding technology that could detect it, failing their students, and taking great pride in failing their students. There was this whole gamut of faculty responses to chat GPT in the university setting. Um, and I want to hear, you know, what is your take? What should a university do writ large? What should individual professors do? Because obviously it's going to take a while before university policy catches up. Um, so what, you know, what are you going to do as, as a professor to deal with this in your classroom? Yeah, so that's a great question. So one of the things I did is I was thinking about this is I thought, where can I get an answer on what I should do as far as AI? <laughs> <laughs> So I asked Chief Chat yeah, GPT, what should be the rules for using you? And it spit out 12 great rules, right? It's like, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Um, and it's, it's essential, I think we have the academic principles are already there that we need to, you know, that we need to think about. Like Chat GPT should not it should help you think, right? Just like I gave you the domain thing, right? It should help you think, but it should it shouldn't do the thinking for you, right? So that should be the general principle. There's also some principles like, you know, basically plagiarism, right? If you just ask it, give it a prompt, and then it spits the whole thing out, and then you copy and paste that as your paper, that's plagiarism, right? That's no different than just copying, you know, huge articles off the internet. So I think the general principles are there. I think going to ChatGPT gave me, you know, a really good base to start from. But this is fundamentally one of the reasons I sent the note to the provost saying, hey, we need to get a task force to go figure this out. So there's been some research on what, if, you know, what percent of universities have, you know, have gotten their act together to go figure this out, and it's only like 14%, right? Which is very small, but that's, again, sort of a testament how slow universities are. <clears throat> I think by fall of next year, we really better have this figured out, at least some of the basic stuff. <clears throat> the way I kind of think about this is something I call the TAME model. So it's Technology Applications and Implications Model. Um, so what are the applications of this technology? It could be any technology, but we'll just say ChatGPT and generative AI. What are the implications of it? Right, I'm sorry, what are the applications of it? So how can I use it to improve student? Because we need to make our students digitally fluent, right? Um, how can I use it in the classroom? Where can I leverage it in the classroom? Where should I outlaw it in the classroom? Uh, how does it change my assignments? Um, but how can, I, and how can I use it to be, make my employees smarter, right? More productive, more creative? 
Uh, so there's lots of ways we can apply the technology. But then the flip side, and that's short term and long term, right? Um, and then what are the implications? So it's applications and implications. So implications are like, what is this thing going to do to me? So what does it do to universities' business models? What does it do to um, how we teach, right? What are our policies for uh, students and faculty? I mean, how can faculty use it to teach and how can they use it? Because it'll do a ton of things that faculty can do, right? Where could we use it? You know, it can, it can, it can write research papers. Uh, it might make up the sources, but it can write research papers. Um, and then administrators. I don't know how many of you heard about what happened at Vanderbilt, but um, the Vanderbilt, one of the colleges in Vanderbilt, the DEI office there sent out, um, you know, the unfortunate Michigan State University shooting. So they sent out one of the statements that says, um, you know, our condolences to um, Michigan State University. We're thinking about you. So they, they had that statement to all, all students. And the thing was they wrote it with ChatGPT. Right, so they wrote what was, should have been a heartfelt thing with ChatGPT, and to compound that, at the bottom of the email they sent to all the students, they said, um, "Generated by ChatGPT." <laughs> it's like, man, that was like that was a double, double dumb mistake. Uh, and so those two people were, that did that were suspended, two administrators. So it's not just students; it's like what do teachers do? What do administrators use? And so we got to figure that out as a basic going into fall 2022. But there's all, I mean, we really need to figure out what does it mean for higher ed, what does it mean for our business model. I think we have, even before ChatGP, higher ed had some major challenges in terms of tuition costs, in terms of where is the value in higher ed, what are we doing with our credentialing, and this thing, I think, just ramped it up, you know, just doubled it, right? So a follow-up on that, what is the general feeling on campus? The people you talk to, are they fearful about ChatGP? Are they, you know, distrustful of their students? What, you know, what are they thinking? I think it's split. I think there's, you know, so think about a bell curve, right? So there's some people that are really thinking about it a lot, right? That they're very, you know, that's probably a smaller group. Um, and so I've got a listserv, and there's different listservs around campus um, and groups thinking about it. Um, and so there's people, there's, there's that group, and they're engaged on it, and they're maybe using it. Um, and then there's a big group that's kind of like knows about it, but really haven't played with it at all. And then there's a big group that's like, how do you spell chat GPT, right? Um, so I think people are at various phases. I don't think, and I think a lot of people are, in some sense, excited about it, but they're also very scared about it in AI in general. There was a survey that was done of Americans. I think 10% thought it would, AI would be both equally beneficial and dangerous. 40% thought it'd be um, more, no, more dangerous. Um, I'm sorry, 10% thought it'd be more beneficial than dangerous. 40% thought it'd be about the same amount of danger versus beneficial. And then 50% said it was more dangerous than beneficial, right? And I would guess faculty are probably the same way, but you know, they're also worried about not just the students, but what does this mean for my job? Like everyone else is, right? Like what does this mean for my job if I'm on a cognitive job? Um, so I think the concern is there. I think they're looking for the university to give them some direction. I think there are pockets of people trying to figure it out. But again, I think this is why, and actually just to, so you know, I'm, I'm meeting with the deans um, April 6th to go do a proposal for a set of task forces to examine everything from applications to implications, short term and long term, um, everything from what do we do with student cheating to what, what does it mean for our business model to what does this mean from, you know, all the disciplines that we have in the school, in the university, like philosophy, uh, history, social sciences, humanities, all that stuff, so. So I think that another question is probably on a lot of people's minds, like, how afraid should we be? Um, I mean, I know when I look at some of the AI that I already use in my house, that it, it cannot function, it is so dumb. My robot vacuum gets stuck every night in the same place. And it's supposed to be learning these things, right? And it just doesn't. And obviously, you know, we've got the Tesla that ran over the lady. So there are, there are um, examples of AI that is supposed to be very high functioning and failing. Um, so, and failing in ways we don't expect. So is it, is it, is it going to be a threat? Um, is it going to do what we want it to do? Uh, what do you think? <clears throat> so in AI, there's this, this is a concept called the alignment problem. 
Um, basically, what the alignment problem is, uh, how many people have seen uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice with Mickey Mouse a long, long time ago? Okay, so in that Sorcerer's Apprentice, <coughs> Mickey is the apprentice, and the sorcerer goes to bed, leaves his hat on the table, and tells Mickey to go bring water from one part, uh, from the well into the house, and you know, et cetera. And so Mickey says, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to put on the hat, and I'm going to charm the broom to go do this. <coughs> and so he does. Goes falls asleep, wakes up, and also the, the broom has done that, but it's also now continued to bring in the water and flooded the house, right? So he tries to stop the broom. The broom doesn't let him. <coughs> That's basically the alignment problem, right? So you set, you want the AI to do A, and it ends up doing B, right? And so that's where you get people getting killed. That's where you get, um, I mean, there's one thing where just now um, ChatGPT4, when it was in testing, was able to convince a human to, you know that, you know, the thing where it says mark all the boxes that, that you know, to show that you're a human, all, all the boxes that contain stoplights. It was able to convince a human that it was, um, it couldn't see well, and so it had to trick the human into actually checking all the boxes, right? So, <laughs> So right now there's a big debate between people like um, Eliezer Yudkowsky, who believes that we're all fundamentally doomed, um, and versus other people uh, who believe that, no, it's a very small chance. Um, and then you, you've got a couple things driving it. So, you know, what's open AI, you know, open Pandora's box, right, to do this, to put ChatGPT four or three, everyone started pouring money into it, right? So Google poured money into it, Microsoft poured money into it. So Silicon Valley, I mean, the amount of money pouring, get, getting paid, poured into AI right now is tremendous. And there's a question of, well, should we slow it down? Um, you know, uh, Brooks' point is like, we haven't figured out social media, so how, <laughs> good luck government figuring out how you're gonna do, do AI. Um, so, and then can we even slow it down? Because if we slow it down, China's throwing money into AI, right? So, you know.